What are you doing? What are you doing, Green? Yeah. What are you doing, Green? Hearing this caged, superb parrot speak with its keeper might just be your best bet in terms of hearing its call at all. My name is Ann Jones and this is RN's Off Track. Borowa District Council has taken the superb parrot on as its mascot and even the bakery in town has a big parrot cutout on its sign. They're everywhere and yet the actual birds are nowhere to be seen this morning as I drive down a lane in the Borowa District. And it, not just because they're rare but also because we're just on that time of year when they return to the local area to breed. They're migratory, you see. The southwest slopes of New South Wales has really turned it on this morning with rolling canola fields and misty valleys and the dams are steaming as I drive past them. And then I turn left up the drive of Steve and Melanie Hive's place and soon after me, a busload of Sydney people turn up. They're from the North Sydney Council Bush Care Group and they've been taking part in the Bridges to Burrawa program which has been going on for 16 years. And they're here to plant trees on the farm primarily for superb parrot habitat, but also for a myriad of other reasons. Okay, thank you everyone for coming today and welcome to Pindari. It's our property here of 400 acres. What I'm hoping we'll do is just over this ridge and up to the next... Hi, I'm Steve Hives and this is my property out here at Bevendale. And we're uh, trying to regenerate some of this um, rocky outcrop area that's gone basically to wasteland. So it's very hard country, very, very thin topsoils here. So planting trees will bring back the moisture in the ground and regenerate, hopefully regenerate the soils a bit better. We're standing almost on the top of a ridgeline and around us are rolling hills. There's a number of large paddock trees, though they're fairly sparse. There'd be at least 60 or 100 metres in between each one. Is there actually any stuff that is remnant original vegetation around here? There is. Um, over the years, back then it was sort of natural to clear the lands for, for grazing, where all that's been turned around now and it's now saying that the stock actually want trees. They want shade, they want shelter. So the more trees in your paddocks, the better off your paddocks re recover from droughts and things like that. We're needing canes um, on some of these rows. Where might we find extra canes for tree guards? Over. I can see them being loaded now. Over. Uh, Gareth Debney, Bushland Management Coordinator, North Sydney Council. We've got 36 volunteers, six staff. Uh, that's just the North Sydney contingent. Um, the Burua people have come out in force this year as well, and there's got to be at least another dozen Burua locals that uh, are here helping to plant today and coordinate things. And how many trees are you hoping to plant this weekend? Between four and a half and five thousand plants. At least half the people on the bus this year have come for five plus years. Some of them almost every single year since 2000. Uh, they. They love it. They get a lot out of it. They feel they get more out of it than what the landholders down here get. Have you ever had this many people on your property? No, I haven't. <laughs> this is this is probably the most people I've had out here, especially working. <laughs> we actually planted 20 or 30 trees ourselves in here, and we were, we were buggered. <laughs> yeah, canes and covers are coming. Great. Can you find Heather when they come down? She's looking for them. No Thanks. Um, my name's Heather McLeod. I work for Burua Community Land Care Group as their coordinator. This is our 16th year and we've planted well over 50,000 trees. That's the trees planted by North Sydney Bush Care and of course Burua Land Care has been planting trees for over 25 years. So huge numbers of trees and as people drive through the Burua region you can really start to see those trees in the landscape now. In this situation I think the tree break is being grown as a, a bit of a windbreak for livestock. And this area, not particularly this site, but this area in general does have a dryland salinity issue. So planting deep-rooted trees can mitigate 
salinity. Um, North Sydney Bush Care Group, as part of their Building Bridges to Burrower program, are particularly interested in superb parrot habitat. So we're trying to create nesting sites into the future, a long way into the future. In the more immediate future, we'll be creating foraging areas for superb parrots. They quite like to forage on wattles, so that's a large part of our planting. What is it like being someone who, who lives and works in this area and having these city people come out um, and sort of, I don't know, really literally start digging the earth? It's wonderful. The, um, the land care group really feels blessed that they've got people from the city who will give up their weekends, who've got you know, busy lives in the city or come out on a weekend and plant trees for them. Uh, it's just something that, that would take them months to do over the winter and the spring to do themselves and to get it planted in a weekend. It, it means an awful lot to the people of Borua. Heather McLeod. At a brisk pace up the hillside, I catch up with Marinda, one of the volunteers from Sydney, and it's her first time along in Burrawa. She's got a huge smile across her face, despite the fact we're setting a cracking planting pace right up a hill. It's like a little factory. We've got people doing the covers, people doing the holes, others planting the trees. Um, someone's coming along and watering them. We've got tractors with water. We've got utes with trees. It's just a hive of activity. I, it's, um, it's actually a wonderful way to spend a day. It makes you feel purposeful, really, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. And on the other end of the scale, Ross McClelland is one of the volunteers who's been coming along for over 15 years. In fact, he came up with the idea for coming out here at all after hearing about the superb parrot's plight as he was travelling through the area 17 years back. I thought, gee, it'd be good if we could get some of our volunteers to help us. We've got hundreds of them. You know, whereas in Bora, they've got no one. Yeah, so I rang the mayor from Bora and had a chat with him and said, do you want some help? And if we could get some of our volunteers to come out and plant some trees for you. And then talk to the North Sydney Council people. I said, oh, yeah, that sounds a good idea. We'll see if we can get it approved. And they got it approved and we came out for the first year and 16 years later and we're here. And it's fantastic. Everyone loves it. Yeah. And we do it every year and we've got a big crew, 35, 40 this year. And the other thing too is just yesterday afternoon we planted 600 trees in an hour and the average age is, I don't know, what do you reckon, 50 something, whatever, at least. And yet, you know, there's this little planting army goes... And we like this here, we've got 1,000 in an hour. This will almost be, you know, finished. And it take the farmers know, a year to do it or something. As you can see, there's a little ant army. And at the end, with all the little white guards around the trees, you can see this up over the hill. There were, yesterday we did 1.2 kilometres in five rows. And so you can see all these little white things, you know, which one day will be all full trees and there'll be birds in it and everything. I'm just amazed how we get it done so fast. The Building Bridges to Burrow program, which is a partnership with the North Sydney Council and the Burrow Community Land Care Group, has just won a State Land Care Award recognising its success. Volunteer from North Sydney, Sissy Stewart, has been a part of it all the way along. I've been coming here almost since its inception. I think we missed the very first one. It's a fixed thing on our calendar and it gives us a bit of an insight into the trials and tribulations of, you know, what happens in the country. And uh, personally, I always feel we go away with more than we brought. I always think we're the tip of the iceberg. We just come and do a bit of planting and there's so much work beforehand. And after 16 years, have you actually seen a superb parrot? Oh, yes. Yeah. What do they look like? They're beautiful. They're, they're not so big and they're green and they have a, a yellow collar. We don't, you know, they don't sort of sit and say, come and look at me. But, but we, do, we have seen them, yes. Ah, well, that's we good. even seen a platypus in the river once, once. <laughs> so we know it's there. <laughs> to get the best take rate, there's actually a lot of technique involved in planting tube stock trees, as demonstrated by Ian from North Sydney Bush Care. He's rubbing his hands together over a small tree in the ground. So could I ask what you're doing there? Uh, just planting the, planting the tree, so I've uh, taken the rocks and stuff out. So by rubbing it in between your hands, you essentially sort of just get, sift off the big sift stuff? Sift off the big stuff, and then when I get a little bit more, just a touch more, I'll tamp it down just slightly, and that'll make a nice hole. Oh, wow. So you actually had it in there, in its little container, so it's made a perfect hole. I hope so. I hope. 
I hope so. The pressure's on. He pulls the tube stock out and massages the seedling out of the tube and there it is, a beautiful hole, the perfect shape for this little plant. And he pushes around the tree a bit. A ring is created, lower than the ground. The seedling effectively has its very own moat. Now I've got to put the tree guard on and call for a water boy just to give it a, that nice soak. And it's got the best chance of all, I'd say, after that. After about an hour, the 35 or so tree planters have cleared right across the ridge line and the property owner, Steve Hyatt, couldn't be happier. Oh, this is fantastic. I, I think more city people should get out here and get into the country and enjoy what it's all about. And what's been your impression of their approach so far? Very gun ho <laughs> They just want to get in and, and start digging. They are raring. They started digging before we even got here. <laughs> I can't believe how energetic they are. I know, me neither. And half of them, what do you reckon the age group of these people are? Not, not... In their late 50s? Yeah, most mid, of them? Middle, middle, middle yeah. age and above, I would yeah. generally say. So, and the best age. Exceedingly well. Exactly. So how long have you been coming out here? Uh, 15 years now. Michael Kelso is another one of the volunteers and he's planting like a man possessed. What sort of changes have you seen on the landscape? Tremendous, actually. From previous year's plantings, we've got plants that are actually tripled in size from when they were actually put in the ground as a tube stock plant or native plant. So going from, say, at least 30 centimetres up to 3.5 metres, incredible. Wow. Great wind breaks, you know, yeah. terrific for the farmers. So what we really get out of it is what we do today is really for tomorrow. So, and that's what we've been working at. Yeah. But I understand that the brewer trips have actually brought you more than a sense of satisfaction. <laughs> Someone's been talking to you on the wind. Yeah, I met my wife down here actually, and uh, that was uh, a very cold, windy day, and uh, it was sunny. But yeah, the camaraderie between us, because um, I get, tend to be cheeky now and again, and uh, it was two opposites. You know, I'm trying to be romantic, she couldn't care less, you know, no matter what I said, you know, how are you, what do you want to know for, you know, beautiful day, who told you that, you know, it's, I thought, right, maybe there's something more to this person, but, you know, uh, and we've been married now for, I don't know, 13 years or more, so, and we just click, you know, we're on the same page, which is terrific, so yeah, to actually have a romance in the country and go back to the city is even more worthwhile, <laughs> but yeah, it's a secret, who told you, the wind. The wind told <laughs> Well, thank you for speaking with me. Okay, thank you. It's spring. It's time for a little bit of love anyway, isn't it? And speaking of love, the superb parrot is due back in the area about now where it'll be looking around for the ideal place to lay its eggs. Heather McLeod, a local. Have you seen the parrot around lately? Yes, they've started to come back to the district. They're um, coming in in sort of th threes and fours. Um, they come in from now um, through, th through the summer and they usually leave again sort of in January. And, and what should I look out for? Oh, they have a particular call. I guess you have to be familiar with the sound that they make and they have a, um, a recognisable flight, flight pattern. But they're a bright green. A lot of the old timers around here call them green leaks. So they're bright, beautiful lime green and they've got um, red and yellow on their heads. Right. Right, I've gone past a couple of green ones in the car already and I, I almost did a Yui, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Over the 16 years, you've managed to put in quite a lot of habitat for the superb parrot. Yes, and do the landholders see them in, in the oh, plantings? yes. Initially, because the... The trees aren't that big yet. You will see superbs coming back and feeding on the wattles. When the pods are forming, they'll feed on the wattles. And if we're fortunate enough to have mature trees in these plantings, particularly mature standing dead timber, which has hollows, then you create an ideal habitat for them. The hollows are already there and then they've got somewhere to feed. But we do get a lot more small birds. They are the ones that come in first. There's a lot of competition for nesting hollows from, you know, all your different parrots to bats to, yeah, so many animals use nesting hollows and we... We're flat out keeping them standing in paddocks and not getting pushed over for firewood. Firewood collection is just one of the threats the superb parrot is facing. 
common miners and also roadside accidents with cars are issues for this small population of birds. On RN, this is Off Track and I am Anne Jones. Standing on the top of a hill near Brewer on the southern slopes of New South Wales, west of Goulburn and east of Young. We're hearing about the planting efforts for the superb parrot organised by the North Sydney Council and the Burrawa Community Land Care Group. They've been working together for 16 years and have planted over 50,000 trees in that time. At Hawk Hill, Sue and Peter Mason are showing me around their property. The Masons have been planting out their own tree lines since the 1970s. Back in those very first plantings, tell me about them. What did you do and did you have success? No, they were absolute disasters. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, we planted the wrong things oh. at the wrong time and didn't do the right preparation. And um, some of them were 100% wipeouts, really. Mm. Uh, and I think after the big 83 drought, when that sort of finished, I think that was when we really started to get our act together. So I think everything we did in the 70s was usually pretty useless, really. Learning. <laughs> and we still make mistakes, you know, but, um, and we still have losses and there's still new problems that occur. And, but it's, um, it's quite interesting. When we started having some successes, we started collecting seeds off some of the better trees and um, had a go at propagating them. How many do you think you may have propagated over the years? Oh, most probably about, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand, 15,000 maybe. That's... Quite an outstanding legacy, really, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't say they all survived uh, being <laughs> planted out. You wouldn't guess it looking around the property. 75% of the fence lines are planted out, not with one line of trees. Sue says that that's just ornamental, but with wide swathes of fenced-off trees, five rows or more in each planting. In front of the hills, there's some patches of canola, which are just yes, some of it flowering just, fully and some of it coming into flower with bright yellow. It mm, looks, it just looks amazing, yes. like a um, fluorescent vest. And back closer to us is your part of this landscape, yes. which are paddocks and lots of trees. Even from up here, you can tell that your tree planting program has been extensive. Yes. So how did it actually start? Why did you start planting? Well, we um, had um, beetle attack and, or dieback. They weren't quite sure which. And, and mainly all that existed on the property were isolated paddock trees. And you can see some remnants and some of the ones that have died in the last 40 years. And really, I, I don't think um, these trees lend themselves to just being isolated trees. I think they do better in communities. So uh, we're trying to replace some of them. We thought that we would end up with no trees eventually. Mm. No live trees, no living trees. And, and that's, um, that's no way to be, is it? Well, not really. <laughs> and um, as you can see, there's still quite a lot of standing timber, which we tend to leave standing. And those big old trees in paddocks and along roads are the places that you're most likely to see the superb parrot, if they're in the area, because they're migratory, you see. Pat Thompson has been observing and keeping superb parrots for a very long time and he explains the superb migratory timetable. Um, they're just coming in, they're just coming into the, into the Boorowa district now. I've seen five this morning, first lot I've seen. For the next month they will hang around, suss out all their um, hollows, nesting hollows, the ones that are left, then they'll go to nest for three weeks, lay the eggs. 
five weeks they'll feed the young ones. Then they'll be on the wing just a week before Christmas. They'll fly them around for about until the second week in January in mobs. They'll gradually get into bigger and bigger mobs and then you'll get up one morning and they're all gone. I'm sort of gobsmacked. Um, They're a beautiful green, lime iridescent almost green, Mm -hmm. with a little bit of a tinge of blue on some of the wings. Now, they are, by the look of them, are they sexually dimorphic? They are different for ladies and men. Ladies, yep. Uh, The male's yellow face. Yep. The hen is all green. How did you come to have these birds? Oh, just over the years, Mm -hmm. just had them. Yeah. So is it, has it been a lifelong thing for you, the bird bird keeping? Probably 40 plus years, 45 yeah. years. How did it start? Just liked them. Yeah? Just liked them, yeah. W- what do you like about them? Oh, they're placid nature. They, they can talk. Years ago, everyone had a pet, had a pet superb parrot. But they were known as green leeks then. They're the pinnacle of all birds. But they're in big trouble. <laughs> so tell me, you say they're the pinnacle of all birds. Now, beautiful, beautiful birds. You say they're in big trouble. What, what's the main reasons? Habitat loss, primarily nesting sites, um, woodcutters, trees gone, big trouble. Pat Thompson tells me he's got a permit to keep his superb parrots, but they used to be in such numbers throughout the district that people just used to take a chick from a nesting hollow and bring that chick up and teach it to talk. What? Hello? What are you doing? What are you doing? You're going to talk now. And now they're taking the nesting hollows. Potentially, in the coming decades, if we don't really secure their existing habitat, which is primarily large uh, hollow-bearing trees, both dead and alive, but also at the same time, if we don't start replacing the habitat with new plantings of trees and shrubs, we will see further collapses and uh, local extinctions of the superb parrot. Damon Oliver works with Ecosystems and Threatened Species in the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage. It's listed under the um, Commonwealth legislation as vulnerable and also in New South Wales under our Threatened Species Conservation Act. So whilst we don't have firm numbers on how many birds are still in the wild, we believe it's well and truly under 10,000 birds. We've also received some um, fairly new information about the fact that certainly in some areas the populations are still declining. We think it's mainly due to two reasons. Firstly, there's a lag effect from the historical loss of a lot of their woodland breeding and foraging habitat, but we're talking about a long time ago now. Most land clearing to a large extent has now ceased in New South Wales. However, just that loss of potentially up to 75-80% of their habitat historically is obviously playing a big part. A lot of our Australian birds are actually quite long-lived compared to birds in the Northern Hemisphere. They do live for many decades. And so what we see is that some populations will hang on for a long time, but their breeding output is really quite low. But because they're long-lived, we still see them over many decades. And then suddenly, once they've got too old to breed, um, the numbers are really low, then suddenly we do see these these localised extinctions happening. What is the legislation in terms of protecting the old trees that we see around us now? Well, that's a very, very good question. Um, in terms of legislation, look, there certainly are rules in place which will protect threatened species habitat. So, I mean, landholders can't just go and knock trees down without getting either approvals under our Threatened Species Conservation Act or through the native vegetation legislation as well. Does that count for trees that are dead in paddocks? Well, that, again, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, dead trees in paddocks which constitute threatened species habitat are, pro- are protected under our threatened species legislation. They're not um, considered to be native vegetation under our native vegetation legislation because they're dead. So there's a little bit of a grey area there which I think some landholders may not be necessarily aware of. So if you've got large old trees which have hollows in them which we think could constitute threatened species habitat, before considering clearing them, they really should come and talk to us about whether in fact it does have habitat values and whether we can come up with some you know, outcome which is both good for them but also for the threatened species. 
Are you aware of any prosecutions or anything that have actually happened of people removing habitat? Oh, look, certainly under our native vegetation uh, laws, there's certainly been cases in the past where, um, where landholders have, um, you know, uh, unlawfully cleared um, living trees on their farms without getting the, the appropriate approvals. It's a little bit trickier with, um, with dead standing paddock trees because there are certain exemptions in our laws for on-farm activities, which does include things like you know, putting in new fence lines, putting in new tracks, other sorts of infrastructure, and also things like you know, collecting firewood for on-farm use. So there, there are some um, areas where landholders are still able to, to remove those trees. I guess what we're trying to do really here though is to, by doing a lot of community engagement work with landholders and land care groups, to try and get the message that where possible to retain those trees. But it's on all of us, isn't it, this conservation? Just let me ask you this, for example. If you live in the ACT or the surrounding area, do you actually know where your firewood came from? Was that tree actually legally felled? Was it a tree that might have had hollows in it? Of course, there are unscrupulous people out there, but there are also huge swathes of people who want to do something, and Damon Oliver is cautiously optimistic about the future of the superb parrot. A few years ago when we started to talk to a lot of community groups about the superb parrot, they really showed a very strong interest in actually becoming citizen scientists and we think it's a fantastic opportunity to get them to start to collect information about the superb parrot. So what we've done over the last two seasons, and when, when, by seasons I mean the, the last two breeding seasons in spring and summer for superb parrots, we've now got a network of about 40 landholders, primarily um, centred around Borua, Yass, um, out as far as Cowra and Grenfell. And what they've been doing is we've, we've established a standardised um, survey technique, which they can do. It's quite simple. It's a one kilometre, one hour um, survey transit they can do along their farm tracks or along their um, you know, country roads where they count the number of superb parrots they see. Thankfully, they are such a distinctive bird that they, they, they really make a very good subject for a community-based citizen science project where people can get in and collect information which will then feed into the conservation of the species. It's, it's very exciting. I think that the superb parrot has intelligent eyes. It wears an expression of a pursed lips sort of smile, a knowing look, and its tail and wings are almost but not quite tinged with blue. It's a charming bird and it's in trouble. The website link to log superb parrot observations is over on our website, abc.net.au slash rn slash off track. And I've also put photos there of tree planting and Pat Thompson's birds too. <laughs>